Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks. For over 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, social justice, politics, and literature. I'm delighted to welcome you to a thought-provoking evening of conversation with Yuval Noah Harari, historian, philosopher, and international best-selling author of Sapiens and Homo Deus. Harari's new book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, signed copies of which are available tonight, untangles political, technological, social, and ex existential issues facing humankind today. Moderating tonight's event is Barry Weiss, a writer and editor for the New York Times opinion section and winner of the Reason Foundation's 2018 Bastiat Prize, which annually honors writing that, quote, best demonstrates the importance of freedom with originality, wit, and eloquence. Now please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Barry Weiss, and our special guest, Yuval Noah Harari. Welcome fellow apes, or maybe I should say welcome a future cyborgs and data cows. Um, Yuval, I think that one of the most amazing things that you've been able to accomplish in your books is sort of helping me see a room of people in a new way. That we are animals despite you know, the clothes on our backs and the iPhones in our pockets, and in 100 years from now, we might be something radically different. So that, I just think that that's an amazing accomplishment. I want to start with a sort of strange question maybe, mm -hmm. which is, should I have kids? And the reason I want to ask you that question <laughs> is because the future that you lay out for us in your work, including your most recent book, 21 Lessons, is very bleak to my mind. And not just because of ecological meltdown or potential nuclear war, but especially because of this kind of biological caste system you lay out, in which a few of us, maybe the lucky few of you are in this room, will become kind of like gods and the rest of us will become useless, the kind of left behinds. And I know I'm gonna be one of them because I don't know how to work in Alexa. So <laughs> I am wondering um, if that's my future, if my future life has no meaning, no work, and you know, very small chance of happiness, why should I bring children into that world? Um, well, the, the future, first of all, maybe you shouldn't. I mean, I don't have any children, and my husband and me have no intention of bringing any. Is that why? Hmm? Is that why? Uh, there are many reasons why, but uh, we, can, we can spend the entire evening just talking about that. Basically, it never occurred to me. I mean, if people didn't tell me that there is such a thing in the world as having children, I would never have thought about it myself. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> might be the difference between men and women, or at least Could part be. of it. Could be. Um, but in any case, talking about this, this issue of the future, it should be very, very clear that the future is not deterministic. Nobody has any idea how the future, how the world would actually look like in, in 50 years. And it's still up to us. Uh, yes, technology is going to change the world in dramatic ways. That's, that's certain. AI and bioengineering will change the world, will change uh, us, humanity in unprecedented ways. But how exactly, this is still up to us. And you can use the same technology to create completely different kinds of societies. Uh, the technology we are now developing really elevates us to the status of gods, the gods of planet Earth. And we can use that power to create paradise or to create hell. But it's, it's up to us. So I'm interested in paradise and not hell. What are a few things that we can do to create that and not to create this dystopian reality where most of us will be rendered useless? What can we be doing now? Oh, there are many things, but the key is to have global cooperation because whatever you do, in order to be effective, it has to be done on the global level. This is not something that any particular nation, however powerful, can do by itself. If you're afraid of, of, of let, let's take a, sim a simple case, like autonomous weapon systems, uh, killer robots. Yeah, it's not such a, a, a difficult 
uh, to understand that this is a very bad idea to develop autonomous weapon systems. But how do you prevent it? If the US unilaterally says, okay, we are, we are banning the development of autonomous weapon systems in the US, this will not be binding on other nations like China or like Russia. So what do you do 20 years from now if the Chinese are developing killer robots? Do you just say, do you just say okay, we are sticking with our ban, we, are, we, don't, we don't mind being left behind? And even if you sign some global agreement on banning killer robots, uh, it's a dead letter. It's very easy to just sign a piece of paper, but how do you make sure that different nations actually live up to their commitments? Uh, and you know, when, when it comes to something like killer robots, it's, it's far more difficult with, with nuclear weapons. With nuclear weapons, if some nation has a, a nuclear weapons program like Iran or like North Korea, they can't really do it in secret. You know that something is happening. But with developing new types of AI, it's much easier to do it in secret. So it's not enough to have an agreement. You need to have real trust between nations. And it's not impossible. If, for example, today, uh, the Germans will come to the French, and despite their history, if the Germans tell the French, trust us, we don't develop killer robots, I think the French will trust them, and for a good reason. If the Chinese say this to the Americans, or vice versa, they won't trust each other. We need to reach a level of trust, like the one between the French and the Germans, on a global level. Otherwise, we have very little chance of regulating the disruptive new technologies of the 21st century. Well, it seems to me that there could easily be trust between open societies or democracies or broadly liberal ones, but it's impossible to have trust with a closed one or a dictatorial one. Correct? Um, it's, how it's could you more possibly difficult. have that trust with a country like China as it currently stands? Well, I don't know how, but if we don't solve this problem, then we are in a very bad situation. Because if we enter an AI arms race, and this is what, what, what's been happening over the last two or three years. Five years ago, almost nobody cared about it. But over the last two or three years, more and more governments around the world realize that this is happening, this is big, uh, this is the key, perhaps, to dominating the 21st century. And we are at the beginning of an AI arms race. And if this continues, then whoever wins the AI arms race, humanity will lose. And I don't know how to gain trust between the US and China. I think what you're doing right now is not working. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> this is a key issue for, for Homo sapiens, for the human species. It's far beyond uh, geopolitics. It's far beyond the interests of this nation or that nation. This is the kind of technology that will reshape the future of life itself. If this becomes subject to an, uh, to an arms race, and to the immediate political interests of this nation versus that nation, it will be extremely difficult to prevent the worst case scenarios. I'd like to talk a little bit about nationalism, which is something that in Sapiens you said was on the wane. Mm -hmm. But if you look around the world these days at Erdoganism, Putinism, Trumpism, Brexit, it seems like nationalism is kicking ass. Mm -hmm. And transnationalism, or at least attempts at it, like the European Union and the Euro and even the UN, have sort of failed. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Well, first of all, nationalism is still much, much weaker than it was, say, a century ago. You just need to count bodies. A century ago, Europeans were killing each other by the million uh, over national conflicts in the, in the First World War. Today, if you look, say, at Europe, for all the talk about the rise of nationalism, very few Europeans are willing to kill or be killed uh, for nationalist ideals. For me, as a historian, the most amazing thing about Brexit was that only one person, as far as, as, far as I know, was killed, mm -hmm. a British MP who was murdered by some uh, right-wing wing fanatic. And you know, a century or two ago, a question like this, should Britain be a part of a European bloc 
or should it be a completely independent country, whatever that means, could only really be decided by a major war with hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people dying and being wounded and losing their houses and so forth. Today you just go and vote about it. And nobody, almost nobody, is willing to kill or be killed over it. And you look at the Scottish referendum, it's the same thing. Uh, for centuries, whenever the Scots wanted to be independent from London, and they wanted a few times, they had to raise an army and they had to fight pitch battles and have their cities being burned by armies sent, sent north from London. Now they just vote about it. And whichever way the vote goes, people accept it. Um, there are places in the world where you, have, you see far more violence, but still nothing like what we saw in past centuries. And yes, there is certainly a resurgence of nationalism and a weakening of transnational or universal uh, values and universal cooperation. And I think this is a, an, an unfortunate development, not because nationalism in itself is, is a bad idea, it isn't. It has contributed enormously uh, to humanity for centuries. It's just that today, the three big problems of humankind, which are nuclear war, climate change, and technological disruption, all of them can be solved only through global cooperation. No government by itself can prevent nuclear war, no government by itself can stop climate change, and no government by itself can regulate AI and biotechnology. So um, we just need global cooperation. Whether we'll actually do it, I don't know, but we definitely need it, and there is room for hope, I think, because one very important thing to know about nationalism, which many people miss, is that it's not eternal, it's, it's not even natural to humans. You hear a lot of talk about like nationalism, it's in our genes, it was imprinted by evolution in Homo sapiens, going against it is, 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 is going against nature. This is absolute nonsense. But tribalism is natural. Tribalism is natural. And but isn't, it, isn't it nationalism a way to sort of um, harness tribalism, which can be extremely violent and dangerous, as you write about in your book? Mm -hmm. in your book? It harnesses it, but it's a very, very different phenomena. When you look at the long-term history of human beings and their ancestors for millions of, of years, we are definitely social animals. And being part of a group part of a tribe and being very loyal to it, yes, this is in our genes, this is in our, our nature. But the chief characteristic of the group that gains human loyalty for millions of years was that it's an intimate community. You know all the other people in your clan, in your family, in your tribe. This is the chief, you know them. The chief characteristic of nations, which appeared only in the last 5,000 years or so, which is yesterday morning in evolutionary terms, is that you don't know these people. I live in a rather small nation, Israel. We have like 8 million citizens. I don't know 99.9% .9 of them. I never met them. I will never meet them. In the US, you have a few more millions. And the same thing, it's, most of them are complete strangers. And it's really a kind of miracle of culture, not of nature, that you can, through education and through propaganda and through, and through a lot of cultural manipulation, that you can get millions of complete strangers to care about one another, to feel that they are part of the same community. This has been very difficult, and this is not something which is natural to Homo sapiens. It's not bad, it's done a lot of good for, for humanity, but it does mean that going beyond the nation is not impossible. I mean, to go from being loyal to 100 people you know to 100 million people you don't know, that's very difficult. Mm -hmm. To go from 100 million people you don't know to 8 billion people you don't know, that's far easier. I want to talk a little bit about, what, before we get to your current book, just a question that I've been struck by in, in reading you a lot over the past few weeks is, how do you have the balls to write the kind of books that you do? Because to me, it's, 
you know, it's like a miracle that you managed to come out of the contemporary university system mm -hmm. and not write a book that only four people read and write a popular history that, you know, with Sapiens, 10 million people, I think, read. Do your fellow academics hate you? And how did you have the courage to do um, something so sweeping in all of these books, really? Well, at first, I didn't take myself very seriously, <laughs> at least with the first book. I didn't think that many people will, will read it. It was originally written for college students and high school students in Israel. Um, so I, I kind of took liberties that looking back was, yes, it's, it, it, it was maybe a bit, uh, a bit frightening, but I didn't think it would reach millions of people around the world. And my fellow scholars, and I don't know what they say about me behind my back, <laughs> but you know, at least to my face, most of them are very nice. And, <laughs> well, now they have and, to suck up and, to you. And very, and, and very encouraging. I think that they, they, many of them are happy that somebody is, is taking this job of bridging. I mean, because, I, I, because you know, if everybody would do what I do, we won't have science, we won't have scholarship. You need people to write these books that only four other experts read. And I did it for, for quite a few years at the beginning of my academic career. But you also need to bridge the gap between uh, the academic world and the public. And I think it's more important than ever today to do so because the most important political problems of the 21st century are also scientific problems. Mm. And if you don't bridge the gap between science and politics, between the scientific arena and the, and, and, and the public arena, the, the public debates, then you can't really understand what's happening in the world. And this is true not only of biologists and computer scientists. It's even more true of historians and, and philosophers and social critics. And my view is that uh, I don't know, philosophers have been preparing for this moment for thousands of years. So you why are so many of them refusing to bite? That's, that's the, the mystery, well, that's the problem. You know, questions like free will, like uh, the meaning of humanity. Philosophers have been discussing this for thousands of years with almost zero impact on the rest <laughs> of humanity because it was most of the time irrelevant. It didn't really matter what you think about these issues. But now these problems are suddenly becoming practical problems of engineering and of politics. So this is the time for the philosophers and the historians and the people in the humanities uh, to go out there and to talk about these issues. It, it's, it is suddenly very, very urgent. Things that weren't very urgent in ancient Athens, they are now extremely urgent. And what you see is that the engineers are taking over. Because uh, philosophers, maybe they are just too patient. Well, we've been debating this for 5,000 years. We can continue to debate it for 5,000 years more. But engineers are impatient. When you design a self-driving car, you can't wait 5,000 years. <laughs> you need to decide ethical questions and philosophical questions now or in the next year or two. Sure, so should these Silicon Valley companies be hiring resident philosophers? Uh, they are doing it or uh, in, in, in different ways, either engineers that reinvent themselves as philosophers, right. or there are some philosophers who are also, in, or at least types of, of philosophers, who are being hired or, or play a part in this. And um, I think, again, that if you want to study something really practical in the 21st century, philosophy is a good bet. More than ever before, more than many of the other things that, that, that people are studying. There are so many things that AI is going to do better than humans in the, in the coming years. Uh, maybe eventually also philosophy, but this will be one of the last uh, uh, fields to fall to automation. So before you've talked about the three challenges facing humanity, biotech, name, name the three for me again. The three big problems yes. are nuclear war, climate change and technological disruption, especially the rise of AI and bioengineering. If you could solve one of those problems, <laughs> which is the most urgent? Oof. Um, they, they have a very different nature. With nuclear war and climate change, it's a kind of simple problem conceptually 
in the sense that everybody agrees what needs to be done. We need to stop this. Some people may not agree that the problem exists. Okay, but granted that if you think the problem exists, then you think that what should be done is to stop it. But with technological disruption, it's a far more complicated problem um, because we don't want to give up on the immense potential of artificial intelligence and bioengineering. And also there is no agreement about what is the best outcome. And many of the projects that frighten some people get other people extremely excited. So here, uh, at least intellectually, the problem is far, far more difficult. I mean, what to do with AI, just stop it, like with nuclear war, this is not the answer. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna talk about the, the sort of power of story, which is something that is a major theme of your new book. You make a strong case that we live in what you call the age of bewilderment. You know, we live in an age in which all of the old stories and the old myths, religion, nationalism, even liberalism and the notion of human rights have sort of collapsed. And there's no new story that's come along that's been compelling to replace them. Mm -hmm. So we need a new story. But you also sort of insist throughout the book that all stories are fictions, they're not true there's not inherently true, even the notion of individuality is a myth. Mm -hmm. So how can we go about building a new story if those are the preconditions? If it's all a construct, mm -hmm. how do we have the wherewithal to construct something and get people to believe in it? Mm -hmm. Well, stories are tools. Humans think in stories. We are a storytelling animal. We don't think in facts, we don't think in statistics, we don't think in equations, we think in stories. So if you want to organize people together, if you want to have an effective society, you need to uh, tell people a story that they can grasp easily and identify with. The story doesn't need to be true. Uh, it needs to be effective. Mm -hmm. And throughout history you have this big debate that all scholars in all civilizations had to confront whether your aim is the truth or whether your aim is social cohesion and social harmony. And almost all, all the, at least the, the, the powerful and successful scholarly establishments reached the conclusion that social harmony is much more important than truth. Truth is like an acid. Mm. Uh, anything you put in it dissolves, which on the individual level, if you are on a quest to find the truth, if you are on the quest to find the ultimate reality, then yes, you go that way, but you can't build a stable social order on that basis. And when you come to judge different stories, then I would say the most important criterion is what is the impact on, on suffering in the world? A good story is a story that reduces suffering in the world. And this is why, for example, uh, liberalism and its belief in things like free will and like individualism and like human rights, even though these things, as far as our scientific understanding goes, there are just myth, like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. So there is, there is also human rights is just a story we tell ourselves. They are not a biological reality. They are not written in our DNA. It's not part of nature that Homo sapiens has a right to this or has a right to that. It's just a story we invented and tell ourselves, and there is nothing wrong with it. Um, the, the real problems begin when people forget, when people lose the ability to tell the difference between the stories that we invent as tools and the reality. So, but here's a story, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, mm -hmm. that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Seems to me that's a really good story. Yeah, it's One that has brought more people out of poverty and, I mean, so, but, you're, but you throw a lot of cold water on the notion that sort of that, let's just call it liberalism, mm -hmm. um, can still hold up, can still be a compelling story. But a story needs to be to adapt and be compatible with 
present day realities. And the realities change. The technological realities, the economic realities change. And the stories that was relevant a thousand years ago may not be relevant today. The stories that was relevant 200 years ago may not be relevant today. Uh, and in, in many cases, it is because of technological changes. But how do technological changes render the story that I just told you? Okay, so let, let's take the, 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 the central ideal mm -hmm. of liberty and freedom and the idea that uh, each individual is endowed with free, free will and I make my own decisions freely and this is the highest authority in the world. In a world where nobody has a technology to hack human beings, to decipher human beings uh, and to predict their choices and manipulate their desires, this story was excellent. And it brought a lot of, of benefits to, to, to humankind. But once you have the technology to hack humans, to decipher and manipulate their desires, a blind faith in free will becomes more and more dangerous because the easiest people to manipulate are the people who believe that all their decisions reflect some mysterious free will. So why should we care about, I don't know, the Cambridge Analytica scandal? So what, so what if, if, if uh, Russian hackers show people fake news stories? It doesn't matter. All human choices reflect their free will. We, are, we have this shield that protects us against all these kinds of manipulations, so we, we don't care about it. Nobody can really understand me. Nobody can really manipulate me. Maybe they can manipulate other people, but not me. And these are the easiest people to manipulate. <laughs> and to develop a healthy skepticism about this idea that my desires reflect my free will, this I think, it was always good to be a bit skeptical about your desires, but it's extremely important to be skeptical today because we are gaining the technology, uh, actually the two necessary technologies to hack human beings. In order to hack a human being, you need to have a very good understanding of human biology and especially of the brain and you need a lot of computing power to amass and analyze all the relevant data. We never had it before, so it wasn't a big problem. But now, or very soon, we will have it. So it's Are you concerned about the sociological implications of telling people that they don't have free will and how it will make them act in the world? Uh, it, will, it will demand a lot of changes in many fields. Uh, the most obvious is, is the legal field. The idea that we punish yeah. people for making bad choices, pff, that's, that should be out. Okay, oh, wait, there, wait, okay. We still need a legal system. So Bill Cosby couldn't control his choices. But uh, we don't punish him for bad choices. We can we, and we should send him to jail for several other things. First of all, if you have the kind of brain that makes these decisions, then, you should be, then society should be protected against you. It's not a punishment for free choices, but you need to protect people. And secondly, deterrence. The brain, when it makes its calculations, takes into account what society does, uh, if you do this or if you do that. So deterrence still works. And thirdly, and most importantly, therapy. If you have the kind of brain that makes these kinds of decisions that harm other people and that harm you, uh, we should try and help you. We should try and, and, and cure you. This sounds uh, like a very slippery slope to eugenics to me. Mm -hmm. The idea that we should protect society from people with bad brains or brains that aren't working right rather than judging them on their actions seems no, to me that it could very easily... We, we don't send to, to somebody to jail just because he has this type of brain and we think that in the future he will make or she will make these kinds of, of decisions. No. But it could easily it, lead to that in a culture in which we have tons of data yes, about everyone and know everything. Yes, th that, that's one of the dangers. But this danger will not go away just because we say, oh, we believe in a free will, so we don't care about it. The more data we amass about individuals and the better we understand what's really happening inside the brain, 
the temptation to go in those dangerous directions is going to get bigger and bigger, and we will have to deal with it. Who in the world is telling the most compelling stories right now? Oh, good question. Um, who is telling the most compelling stories? Compelling in the sense of making people... Convincing people. Convincing people. Uh, a compelling story and a good story is, to is to to totally different things. Okay. What, what okay. we see now is a resurgence of a lot of nostalgic fantasies mm -hmm. uh, coming from Make the direction of, of, of nationalism and of religion. As the stories that were dominant in the 20th century are, are collapsing or are in danger of collapsing, then uh, nostalgia becomes very, very tempting. And in this sense, it's very compelling especially in an age of accelerating change, when you come to people and say, no, there is an eternal truth that never changed and will never change. It doesn't matter what happens with AI. It doesn't matter what happens with biotechnology. It doesn't matter what happens with climate change. These truths will be there forever. Mm -hmm. This is who you really are. You don't need to care about. This is now very, very tempting. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem is that it doesn't offer any serious vision for the future of humankind and for how to deal with these problems. I know you don't have children and you're not planning on having them, but if you had one, <laughs> what story would you raise her on or which set of stories? Which set of stories? Um, well, I would most importantly try to um, uh, teach what is the difference between fiction and reality. Mm -hmm. And the best test, and the easiest, there are many tests to know the difference between what is a fictional entity, what is a fictional story, and what is reality. But the most important test, I think, is the test of suffering. If you want to know whether an entity is real or whether it's just the hero of a fictional story, you should ask, can it suffer? Mm. A nation cannot suffer. Even if a nation loses a war, it doesn't suffer. It doesn't have a mind, it has no consciousness, it has no feelings. Uh, similarly, a corporation cannot suffer. Uh, a currency like the dollar or the euro, even if it loses half its value, it doesn't suffer. All these things are stories we created. Important stories, powerful stories, but they are just stories. Uh, human beings are real, animals are real. They, they really suffer. So, I don't know which stories will dominate uh, the world of, say, 2050, but I, I do hope that people will retain this ability because it's so difficult. I mean, to take a, a much simpler example, if you think about uh, uh, football, or at least what is in most of the world is known as football, <laughs> how, how do you call it here? Soccer, Soccer. you call. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still under the impression of the World Cup. So. <laughs> um, to play football, you need to convince at least 22 people to believe in a common story, which is obviously a human invention. The rules of football are, we invented them. They didn't come from physics, they didn't come from biology, they didn't come from some god, we invented them. Uh, to play and, and, and enjoy football, you need to convince at least 22 people to believe in this story for 90 minutes. But what but the danger is, that if somebody gets caught up in the story too much, like a football hooligan, <laughs> and starts beating and even killing other people because of what happened in the game, then that person has forgotten the difference between fiction and reality. And it's easy to see it happening, at least if you're not a football hooligan yourself, it's easy to see it, the difference in football. It's much, much more difficult to see this difference when it reaches the level of believing in the nation or the corporation or the dollar. The book, uh, in the book you promised 21 lessons for the 21st century, but it seems to me that if I had to reduce it to one, it would be sort of what you just touched on before, which is that there is human suffering in the world and that's the only real thing. And the best thing that we can do, at least to begin with, is to observe it and meditate on it. <laughs> is that right? Uh, no. I mean, I was afraid when, when I wrote... I feel like it's a stealth argument for, like, Buddhist meditation. In a way. Well, I do. I certainly practice and, and, uh, and recommend to people 
uh, the, the type of meditation that I practice. But when I wrote the book, one of the things I feared is that because also the last chapter of the book is about meditation, I was afraid that people will come away with the impression that what I'm saying is, well, the silver bullet that will solve all of humanity's problem is just meditate. And this is definitely not, it, it, won't, it, it won't be the solution. I don't think, especially because I meditate myself, I, I meditate for two hours every day, I go every year for a 60 days Vipassana retreat. Yeah. I know how difficult <laughs> it is. I am under no illusions that eight billion people are going to start meditating anytime soon. And even if they do start meditating, for many of them, they will take it in all kinds of very problematic directions. <laughs> when, when you just sit there with your mind and you cannot distract yourself with your smartphone, with your television, with your computer, you just sit there and just have to observe your mind as it is. This is so difficult. And what you see is often so shocking and so painful mm. that the temptation to take it in all kinds of very dangerous directions is, is, is very serious. And we have a lot of examples from history from how, for how you know the best ideas about love and compassion more people were killed and persecuted in the name of the religion of love, Christianity, than in the name of any other idea in human history. Mm. It's the most, the religion of love turned out to be the most intolerant religion in human history. And Buddhism has its own share of skeletons uh, in the closet and in the basement and in all kinds of places. It's just, Humans are so difficult. <laughs> Things that look wonderful on a small scale, when you're just in some cave in the Himalayas <laughs> or in a small ashram with a couple of, of, of other monks or in a monastery in the Syrian desert, when you try to scale it up to millions and billions of people, all kinds of strange things like the Inquisition and the Crusades tend to crop up. See, and I would say that this is an argument against the kind of global cooperation that you're imagining, meaning that's what makes me uh, skeptical of it mm -hmm. and pessimistic. Because as you've sort of argued convincingly to me through the course of these, these three books, humans are barely able to look beyond the nation. I mean, the nation was even a stretch. Mm -hmm. A very big stretch, yeah. So how are we going to get to the global thing? Oh, it's going to be difficult and maybe we'll fail. But uh, we have to try. Because I, don't, I just don't see how you can, the, the fact that this is the maybe only way to solve our major problems doesn't guarantee we'll actually succeed. Maybe it's the only way and we won't be able to do it. Uh, but I just don't see how you can solve something like climate change or like uh, uh, the dangers of, of bioengineering unless you have substantial global agreement, substantial global cooperation on these issues. Now, I, I'm not completely pessimistic. It can be done. Uh, the, 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 the best example we have so far is how humankind has managed to deal with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. In the 1950s and 60s, um, you had all these doomsday prophecies that the Cold War is going to end in a nuclear war which will destroy human civilization, and it didn't happen. Um, I can say about myself personally that I think that the event that shaped not only my life, but also my perception of history more than anything else was the end of the Cold War. And... Um, How so? Well, first of all, if it ended in a different way, I wouldn't be here well, and yes. you wouldn't be here and <laughs> nobody would be here. Uh, so it, it, it was a great achievement uh, for, for humankind. And it was achieved through really not direct global cooperation, but it wasn't the achievement of one nation. It was definitely not the achievement of the United States by itself. Um, ma many of the most difficult decisions that led to the, um, uh, to the peaceful resolution of the Cold War were done in Moscow. And the fact that the Soviet Union, you know, not just the Soviet Union, but the, the communist leadership in Moscow and, and Gorbachev in person 
they gave up more power than anybody else in the history of humankind. If you think who gave up the most power in the history of humanity, the prize will go to Gorbachev. And this is a big thing. What does that tell you, though? What are you, what are you, what are you getting at when you're saying that? No, I, I'm just saying that you, 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 earlier when we spoke about this, how can you get cooperation between mm -hmm. different political systems? So when I look at the end Is of the- Is it the answer that they knew they were losing? Lots of people, when they know they are losing, they don't give up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the time that the Soviet leadership, or at least part of it, gave up, they were still in control of the most powerful conventional army that ever existed. And this army was loyal. If Gorbachev gave the order to fire, they would have fired. They had enough nuclear power, nuclear weapons to destroy the whole of the world several times over. If you had somebody else instead of Gorbachev in Moscow, if you had Milosevic, if you had Ceausescu, mm -hmm. if you had uh, people like that in Moscow instead of Gorbachev, you would have got a very different result. Many times in history, even if you see that you're losing, when Hitler saw that he was losing, he didn't say, oh, okay, so it didn't work. <laughs> Let's give up. He didn't? <laughs> Not as far as I know. <laughs> um, I want to read you a line that stuck out for me from the book and then ask you about it. You write that revolutionary knowledge rarely makes it into the center because the center is built on existing knowledge. The guardians of the old order usually determine who gets to reach the centers of power and they tend to filter out the carriers of disturbing, unconventional ideas. I wanna ask what this says about you. How did you man manage to smuggle yourself into the center to be celebrated by people like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Barack Obama and name every fancy person and at the Davos and Aspen crowds? Does it say something about the nature of your ideas that they're not as unconventional and disturbing as they seem or are you just very, very good at promoting yourself? Um. <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, I, I don't know much about promotion. All the credit for, for the success of this really goes to, to my husband uh, and to my, my team who, who support. I just know how to write books. But everything else, uh, really, the, the genius behind it is, is, is my husband. And um, whether the, the success means that actually my ideas are not really disturbing for, for, the, for the old order, yes, this is a possibility that, that I think about. And you know, when your books fail, it's very easy to tell yourself, oh, they fail because they are so revolutionary <laughs> that people refuse yes. to. <laughs> so it's actually a, a, a badge of honor. I fail. <laughs> this means that I'm, I'm telling the truth and nobody's willing to, to, to listen. Um, what he says about, you know, I, I'm a Yopico, but I think they're good. But <laughs> they are. They're very good. It's just, it's interesting to me that they're being embraced by people that in a way they're arguing against. Mm -hmm. And that the sort of, in my view, the, I don't know if you'd identify with this word, but the sort of nihilism of some of it is not being recognized for what it is. Yeah, you, you can read any book on many different levels. And I, I guess that's also true of, of what I write. Um, and, and many times I have this experience that I, I, I receive reactions, which I realize they read the book in a completely different way that I intended. But this, again, it's a very, very old uh, experience of authors and writers that once the book is out there, you have no control or very little control about how people will read it and what people will do with it. The ability of humans to interpret and reinterpret uh, texts and stories is absolutely astounding. Um, so... I don't know, in time will tell. I mean, what I try to do in my books is above all to change the conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I see my books, and especially the last book, I mean, 21 Lessons, it's not, a, it's not really a book of, of lessons in the sense of uh, these are the answers to the world's problems. They're, it's really a book of questions. It's telling people, look, these are the most important questions we should be dealing with. Yes, immigration is important, terrorism is important, uh, trade relations with China are important, but there are far more important things going on that we are not paying enough attention to. I, for instance, uh, followed the last US elections in 2016, and I was amazed that nobody was talking about AI mm -hmm. and about biotechnology. 
uh, you had Donald Trump saying things like the Mexicans will take your jobs. Uh, but he didn't say the robots will take right. your jobs. Why not? I mean, even if it's not true, who cares about <laughs> the truth? It's, it's, a very, uh, 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 it's a very powerful story to tell. The robots will take your jobs. And he never suggested, OK, forget about the wall on the border with Mexico. It won't help. We need to build a wall on the border with California. This is where the real <laughs> problem starts. Never suggested it. So, and you know, the only thing they talked about with all regard to the AI and the information revolution and all that was Hillary Clinton's emails. Right. Now, emails, this is like, what, 1990s? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so it's like a delay of 20 years. In 2038, the 20, 2036, they'll be talking about AI. Right. But we need to talk about AI now. And similarly, I was, I was watching the Brexit debate in Britain. And Britain is still one of the most important powers in the world. It still has a seat on the Security Council. I mean, I would say to the British, you don't want, you don't care about the world? OK, give back your, your, your place on the Security Council. Give it to somebody who really cares about the world. Give it maybe to Germany, give it to Brazil, give it to India. You want to be out of it? OK, but give it up, right? I mean, and when I watched the Brexit debate, I was amazed not only by the lack of interest in the impact on the rest of the world, but also in the fact that it was all so like, you know, 19th century stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the three big problems, again, nuclear war, climate change, technological disruption, how does Brexit help us prevent nuclear war? It doesn't. How does Brexit help us deal with climate change? It doesn't. How does Brexit help us regulate artificial intelligence and bioengineering? It doesn't. It just makes things more difficult uh, because you need global cooperation to regulate these things. If you have a, a strong EU, that's much more easy than if you have 28 or something independent countries. So I don't think there is inherently something wrong with nationalism or with wanting to be an independent nation. But in the 21st century, we should realize no nation can be independent. No nation can be ecologically independent. Right. You cannot build a wall against rising oceans or against rising temperatures. And no nation can be independent uh, when it comes, again, to AI and bioengineering. So knowing that these are the three big ones, a young person comes to you who's about to enter university. What do you tell them to study, and how do you tell them to spend their time? Um, I would first of all say that nobody has any idea how the job market would look like in 2050. Anybody who tells you that they know how the job market will be and what kind of skills will be needed, they are probably either deluded or mistaken or whatever. So just start with the understanding that it is unknown and that most probably you will have to reinvent yourself repeatedly throughout your career. Not just the idea of a job for life, but the idea of a profession for life, this is outdated. If you will want to stay in the game, <clears throat> you will have to reinvent yourself repeatedly. And you don't know what kind of skills you'll actually need. So the best investment is to invest in emotional intelligence and mental resilience hmm. or mental balance. Because the, maybe the most difficult problems will actually be psychological. Like the, ex that, the anxiety and stress. Yes. I mean, it's so difficult to reinvent yourself, to learn new skills. I mean, it's difficult when you're 20. It's much, much more difficult when you're 40. And to think that you have to do it again every, and when you're 50, and again when you're 60, because you'll have longer life, lifespans and longer careers. So emotional intelligence and mental stability and mental balance, I think, will be the most important assets. The problem is, it's the most difficult things to, to teach or to study. You can't read a book about emotional intelligence and, OK, now I know. And most teachers they themselves are the product of the old system, which emphasized particular skills and not this ability to constantly learn and reinvent yourself and, and keep your mental balance. So we don't have a lot of teachers who are able to, uh, to teach these things. 
but do you think that the humanities and the classics have a role to play in that they are concerned with the big questions about the meaning of life and how to live a good life, or are those now irrelevant? No, as I said in the beginning, I think they are more relevant than ever before. Uh, in, 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 in many practical ways. Because a lot of questions are going to kind of migrate from the department of philosophy to the department of engineering and the department of economics. And questions like, what do you really want to do with your life? Mm -hmm are going to become far more practical than ever before, given the immense powers that technology is giving us. And, and the ability to change yourself, to change your body, to change your brain, is going to put enormous philosophical challenges in front of, of the average person. You need to make the kind of decisions that for most of history, were the stuff of uh, thought experiments by philosophers. What would you do if you could be this or you could be that? I mean, for, all of, for most of history, you couldn't. It was impossible, so why should I care about it? But in 20 years or 50 years, maybe you can. Uh, so in this sense, I think that philosophy and the humanities in general are maybe more important than ever before. Before I ask you, Val, one last question, I want to point out, we're going to go to Q&A in a second. There are two microphones, I think, that should be set up. Um, you can line up in front of those microphones, and I'll call on you. And please actually make them a short, concise question. Um, before we go to the audience, maybe a cheesy question, but one I've been thinking about, given cheesy your skepticism. Cheesy questions are good. Who are your heroes? Oh, who are my heroes? Hmm. You mean like historical heroes or personal heroes? It's up to you. Um, <laughs> well, Gorbachev is, is, as I mentioned before, I would say at least from the historical leaders of the last century or two, I, I most admire him because I think I owe him my life. And most of humanity, in a way, owe, owes him th their lives. And I, I really admire his ability to give up power which is so difficult uh, for humans to do. For thousands of years, they just accumulate it. To, to give it up, it's so, so difficult. So uh, I admire him. Do you admire Reagan? Um, never thought about it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Maybe um, he's one of the reasons that Gorbachev gave it up. I don't know. I mean, again, you, it's, it's a different situation. I mean, yes, maybe without Reagan, Gorbachev would not need to give up so much power, but still, Gorbachev's job was far, far more difficult than Reagan's job. Uh, there are many leaders who can, who can fight successful wars, but to be able to give up so much power, when you, you really don't have to, nobody can actually compel you. It's not, again, it's not Hitler in Berlin in 1945, mm -hmm. the Russians are, are closing. And okay, you don't want to give up power, the Russians are coming to your bunker, what do you do? Nobody could storm Moscow in 1989. You couldn't. You couldn't send armed divisions to conquer Moscow. It had to come from the Soviets. Uh, so in, in this sense, I, I would still admire Gorbachev more than Reagan. <laughs> you want to pick one more, or do you want to just stick with Gorbachev and we'll go here? Uh, I, I think we'll be, I'll think about it more and if okay. I have, Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, under the category of stories, uh, religion seems to be especially problematic right now. And I was just wondering, in a time like that might happen, going forward with society in the face of it. Thank you. Um, religion, well, it's far, far less important than it used to be because it gave up most of, or it lost, not gave up, it, it lost most of its practical uh, powers. Um, a thousand years ago, when people needed rain, when people faced an economic crisis, when people faced a war, and people faced an epidemic, they would go to the priests. They would pray to the gods. And gradually, religion lost almost all of these uh, roles. Uh, today, even the religious people, when there is an epidemic, they first of all go to the doctors. When there is no rain, they first of all go to the, to the engineers. If it doesn't work, also, okay, so let's go to the priests. Uh, <laughs> but the, the first 
your first call is to the doctor. And religion retains its, its, uh, its importance mainly in shaping people's identity, which is still a very important role, but much more narrow than it was a thousand years ago. Um, I would say that today almost all the world in many important fields is, belongs to a single civilization uh, when it comes to building a hospital or building a bomb, there is almost universal agreement about how to do it, irrespective of religion. If you go to a hospital in Tel Aviv or in Tehran or in Tokyo or in New York, it's more or less the same thing. And if you go to a nuclear reactor, the same. They, they have a total agreement about nuclear physics, the Israelis and the Iranians. <laughs> so uh, they disagree about what to do with it. <laughs> but they all agree that E equals MC square. And if you enrich uranium, you can do all kinds of interesting stuff with it. Uh, there is no disagreement there. Um, so I think religion has lost m most of its traditional roles. Uh, again, if you think about Jesus, most of the time he was healing the sick. Uh, today, this is the job of doctors not of, of, of priests. But when it comes to identity, it's still very important. And unfortunately, it's mainly divisive. Um, we need a gl more global cooperation. Religion could have been a source of global cooperation because at least some religions espouse universal values. But in practice, when you look at the world today, you see that in most cases, when, where religions are powerful, they have become the handmaid of nationalism. Whether it's uh, Sunni Islam in Turkey, or Shiite Islam in Iraq, or Judaism in Israel, or Catholicism in Hungary and Poland, or Orthodox Christianity in Russia, in most places where religion has a, an, an important role to play, it's simply the handmaid of nationalism supporting the state. Uh, so this is quite unfortunate, but this is the case. Yes, go ahead. Hello, huge fan, thank you. Um, I do share your belief uh, or desire to distinguish reality between fiction, uh, so much so that I've often asked myself the question, why is that the better orientation? Because I think there's pros and cons to each. Uh, in the stories world, there's like comforts that you don't get if you're looking at things ruthlessly. So one is like, why do you think that's the better orientation? And two, uh, what kind of things give you comfort if you don't kind of like have those stories anymore? I, I, I'm difficult hearing them because of the echo. What are the things that give you comfort? Uh, yeah, so if you're looking at things, is this better? Yes. Okay, so you mentioned uh, about distinguishing fiction from reality, and uh, I, I share that belief with you, but also there's pros and cons to living in each way. If you believe in the stories, you also get comforts that you don't get from mm -hmm. looking at things in a very um, cold and realistic way. So why, uh, question number one is why do you think that distinction is actually like worth it? And uh, question two, what kind of things give you comfort if you don't have the warmth of the traditional stories that are outdated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, stories can be extremely comforting. Uh, and this is why it's so difficult to give them, to give them up. And um, yeah, th that's the case. And this is why most people don't give them up, but hold on to them. Um, for me personally, and, and this is just me, I'm not saying that it, it works for, for every, everybody, I take great comfort from, from reality, from just the ability to see reality clearly. I, I, I find it extremely uh, comforting, especially because one of the things you see, you realize, is that so much of the problems that you need stories in order to, 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 to find comfort in, the problems too actually are the result of other fictional stories in which you believe. Um, so if you can really go beyond these stories, many of the problems just solve themselves. But at least this is how it works for me. I don't think it works the same for every person. Yes. Hi. I, I very much enjoyed reading Sapiens and, and Homo Deus. And in the excerpt I read of the new book and what you talked about tonight is the importance of needing to reinvent yourself uh, on multiple occasions in the future. And that much of what will be learned in school and college now will largely be uh, irrelevant. Um, 
given the rise of nano degrees and coding boot camps and, and um, school opportunities that are short and targeted to specific jobs, people still seem to require a four-year college degree in this country. And when politicians talk about the education system, they talk about making that free or not free. But I'm wondering if you see any um, signs that the, the four-year college degree is changing. Or are we sort of stuck with that and anything is going to be layered on top of that? Because it seems like a lot of money and a lot of time mm -hmm. to invest in something that will not really last you as long as it used to last. Thank you. Yeah, I think that the entire educational system is facing a huge crisis. And it's really the, the first system that faces this, this growing crisis because it needs to confront the future. Um, when you think about what to teach today in school or college, you have to think in terms of 2040. And we don't have the answers. So if you talk to experts in the educational field, and almost all of them will tell you that the system is, is becoming more and more irrelevant. But what can replace it, we just don't know. And you know there are many experiments being done. And they work, some of them, quite well on a small scale. But it's very difficult to scale it up from the level of the experimental small school to the level of an entire system with millions of teachers and tens of millions of, 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 of students. And I definitely don't have the answer. I don't think that anybody at present uh, have the answer. It's also one of the problem is that we already have a system. We don't start from scratch. And the inertia of the system is immense. You have all these buildings. You have all these teachers. You have all these bureaucrats. I mean, it's, it's, it's an immense system. And um, I think this is the, 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 like the tip of the iceberg, that here we are encountering for the first time this shock of, of the future world. And um, it's too early to expect to have the answers. We, we hardly began the debate. But and my impression is that the educational system, to be, to be relevant, will, ha will have to switch from focusing on information and skills uh, more in the direction of things like emotional intelligence, of mental balance, of learning how to learn, and not learning a particular skill. Two quick questions before we go um, to you guys. One easy, one hard. They're both from Facebook. Madeline asks, where do you get your news from? And Emma asks, does the singularity scare or excite you? Oh. Um, where do I get my news from? Yes. I, I tend to read long books. <laughs> I, I, I distrust. Well, and short, you don't have a smartphone. I don't have a me. smartphone. I tend to distrust uh, short texts. Um, does that mean you're not a New York Times subscriber? I, I, hardly, I hardly read newspapers at all. <laughs> I, 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 just, I, I read books written by some New York, New York Times journalists, <laughs> but I, do, I tend not to follow the, the immediate news cycle. I think more in centuries than hours. Um, um, so uh, this is a kind of answer. Again, it, it works what's, for me. What's I the don't... most recent book you read that you loved that you'd recommend? What's my, the most recent book I've, I've read uh, that I loved? I just read a very interesting book about the opium war between Britain and China in the early 19th century. I think it doesn't con it's not considered news anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, opioids are news? Opi so yeah, that some actually, actually, this is very, one of the, of the new books that I've just downloaded, I, I listened to books on, on audio, is about the opioid. Uh, epidemic now in, in, in the USA, and the, 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 the similarities between China in the early 19th century and the USA today uh, suddenly becomes quite, quite striking. Um, singularity. Singularity. Um, I, I try to, 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 to remain calm with it. I mean, to take <laughs> it into account, yes, it is likely that we are reaching an inflection point beyond which our imagination fails. We cannot say anyth anything meaningful about how the world would look like 100 years from now. 
This is how I understand the singularity. Not in terms of some big bang or laws of physics or something like that, but the point beyond which you just can't look. So when you look to the past, many physicists call the big bang a singularity. The, 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 the question what happened before the big bang is meaningless. We don't have the abilities, the tools to look before. And we are approaching very fast a new point of singularity, not 14 billion years in the future, but maybe 50 or 100 years in the future, which you simply cannot look beyond. Our imagination fails because one of the things that are going to change is our imagination. Once you have the technology to re-engineer the human imagination, by definition, you cannot imagine what will happen after that. Yes. Um, you mentioned in, your, in, in this book um, how important it was for you personally to understand story versus reality. It defined who you are as a, a scientist, as a historian, and a researcher, which I would, I would say majority of the world does not think like that, and I will include other scientists, historians, and researchers. What inspired you to one, learn that distinction for yourself. Um, from my knowledge, the only person I know who was that adamant was Werner Erhard, or was it someone else that uh, inspired you to take on that structure for yourself? Um, Try and keep it short so we can get to as many okay. questions as possible. It, it's just that I, I got fed up of being repeatedly told these fictional stories when I was asking you know, these big questions about the meaning of life and what are we doing here, and what's, uh, what's, what's the point of all that? And you get again and again all these fictional stories, and I, I just really got fed up with it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, this is, a, this is a question about stories. One of the uh, stories that is being told now seems to be coming from the opposite end of AI stories, and that's the neuroscience of the emotions. The neuroscience of the emotions, of course, stresses the body and feeling. And I find, uh, I would like to ask you about the contradiction. One of your solutions is that people should become more aware of themselves. But if they, if they do not think of themselves as bodies, if they think of themselves as mental apparatuses, which could be, which could be manipulated technologically, then you have a tremendous contradiction there. I, I would just ask mm -hmm. you to address this. Great question. Well, um, I think we are very far from understanding consciousness and the mind and our mental experiences, but we are making tremendous and in ways frightening advances in understanding what is happening on the level of the body and of the brain. And there are very often in, in, in history, in the history of science, this, uh, this huge gap between our ability to manipulate and our ability to understand the consequences of the manipulations. And we are becoming frighteningly good in deciphering and manipulating human emotions, while we are not good at all in really understanding the human mind and what the consequences will do. We are basically now conducting experiments on billions of human guinea pigs without any idea what the consequences will be. In the past, we did it on the planet. We gained the ability to manipulate the ecological system, to cut down forests and drain swamps and so forth without understanding the complexity of the ecological system. And the result is that the ecological system is now collapsing. The same thing might happen, I, I, this is one of my fears, mm -hmm. on the internal level of the internal ecological system. We are very far from understanding the complexities of the human mind but we are becoming very good in manipulating emotions and thoughts and, and, and so forth. And uh, this gap may result in an internal ecological collapse of our mental system. Thank you. I am so sorry, this has to be our last question and I'm seeing people that I know and want to allow them to ask questions, but hopefully you can find him after. Go ahead. I'll keep it very short. So you talked a lot about internal uh, threats to humanity uh, the three that you mentioned tonight and in the books. And just a fun question, I'm very curious to know about your personal belief. Had there been extraterrestrial life, 
that threats humanity, will that unite us? I couldn't hear the threats. So I'm humanity. saying Will that if, if your personal thoughts, I know that you're a historian, but we talked about the future too. Had there been, if we found that there's extraterrestrial life. Oh, extraterrestrial life. Terrestrial, oh, okay. sorry. Yes. Will I'm, that, and, and they come not necessarily with an olive branch, but, you know, and, and will that, is, is there a possibility that that can unite Could humanity? Could that unite us? Well, um, Thank you. It is a possibility. Uh, it's a I don't know of any scientific evidence for the existence of uh, life outside planet Earth, but statistically it sounds quite probable that somewhere there is something. Um, whether it will uh, be helpful in uniting us, I think we have enough on our plate on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Even without aliens coming and adding more. <laughs> um, I think that, again, nuclear war and climate change and the threat of technological disruption should be enough uh, <laughs> to, to unite our species. Um, if not, we may not live long enough to encounter uh, the aliens. And on that hopeful note, uh, please give Yuval Noah Harari a round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, I want to remind you uh, that you can buy signed copies of 21 Lessons for the 21st Century straight out those doors. Thank you all so much. Thank you.